those animals have a specific quality that they symbolize. Okay? And that specific quality is necessary in our spiritual practice. So those qualities we're talking about do not have tangible, physical, touchable, smellable, tasteable form. So to symbolize those qualities, these animals are given. These animals are given because they're easier to remember the symbolism or the quality we are supposed to develop in our spiritual practice. It's as simple as that. Because it is not just these animals. There's example of many, many animals. There's the elephant, all that in Buddhist symbology. Okay? Example, the elephant will represent sturdiness or uh, not giving up strength. Okay? Example, the pig represents ignorance. The snake represents hatred. And the chicken or the rooster represents pride, arrogance. So those three are in the samsara wheel in the center, right? But we don't need to go any deeper. Why the pig? Why? The, just never mind. That's what it represents. And then when we see that, because ignorance, hatred, anger, and arrogance doesn't really have a tangibility. So in artwork, if you just draw, if you write the word, you know, pig, snake, and rooster is kind of not artistic. So if they're going to draw an animal, they draw that to represent it. Because snakes are known very much to have a lot of anger. These snakes, you know, vengeful, and they bite and they kill with a lot of venom. And roosters are very cocky, and they're very bright, and they, and they have a lot of hens, and they, with the way they walk around is very, I'm, I'm the king of the jungle. And the pig is known to look very just happy in the mud, cannot look up. So quite narrow-minded and quite small and cannot move forward. I mean, it's a representation, so animals are used to represent this, nothing more. Just like in a, in a wheel of life. Your reality is a reality that is stained, that arises from illusions, that arises from projections, that arises from contaminated thought, action, and based upon a lot a lot, a lot, a lifetimes and lifetimes of wrong view. So when you have your projection, when you have your thought, that very thought that you have now and the way you exist, the way you look things, the way you perceive things is what makes you very confused, go up and down, become depressed, become happy and unhappy. So you shouldn't do things to indulge in your projections more. Exactly. Why? You're already unhappy as you are, basically. You're not bad. Unhappy and bad is very different. You're already unhappy. You already go up and down. You're already depressed. You already have doubts. You already have fears. You already are already in darkness. And you're not omniscient. We are not. So we already have that. So when we indulge that further, indulge means to nurture that, to give more to that, it'll become worse. So when you indulge in that, you go deeper in samsara. So what is it telling you? Practice Dhamma. No. There are bodhisattvas who are manifestations of Buddhas, and there are bodhisattvas that are actually Buddhas. Are actually bodhisattvas. Bodhisattvas that are actually bodhisattvas. Yes. Because why? If a bodhisattva was a Buddha, right, then there are no stages to Buddhahood. Then we jump from our level to a Buddha directly. That's not possible. So there's a factory worker that, that paints the car and then there's a CEO. In between them, do you think there are many positions to become a CEO? But are they enlightened? There are bodhisattvas that are actually bodhisattvas on different levels, ten levels, and then there are bodhisattvas who are manifestations of Buddhas who manifest as a bodhisattva. So there are bodhisattvas who are enlightened, and there are bodhisattvas who are posing as a bodhisattva, and there are bodhisattvas who are not enlightened, who are actually bodhisattvas. She is a Buddha posing as a Bodhisattva. Yes. Manjushri, Maitreya, Vajapani, Avalokiteshvara, all these are Bodhisattvas who are Buddhas posing as Bodhisattvas. Why? I don't know. It's such a big, huge, divine masquerade party, I guess. Yeah, Buddhas. Why? 
because there are deities that are manifestations of them who are Buddhas. Therefore, if, the, if the manifested is a Buddha, the manifest core must be a Buddha too. If you want to know who you can take refuge in, you can take refuge in everything that's in a Guru tree. Have you seen the Guru tree at KH? Everything that's in that Guru tree, you can take refuge. Anything beyond, you don't. Right? That will classify what is an enlightened being or being that is able to take you out of samsara. When you take refuge in an enlightened being, it means a being that's qualified to take you to enlightenment. Bodhisattvas can be qualified to take you to enlightenment. Eighth level, ninth level, tenth level, qualified to take you to enlightenment. Then there are very highly enlightened or highly advanced Dakinis, highly in, in, uh, advanced Dharma protectors, they can take you to enlightenment. There are even uh, ma, uh, Maha Arhats or Arhats that are of higher level or higher level, they can take you to enlightenment. So there are many, many beings that can take you to enlightenment. We take refuge in beings that can take you to enlightenment. It's not necessary, they are inverted commas enlightened. But in general, when you tell people you should take refuge only in enlightened beings, what it means is beings who are non-spiritual, such as demons. That's actually the meaning behind the symbology. So, for example, if you say that uh, can we, we should take refuge in enlightened beings, and therefore I need to know if this Bodhisattva is enlightened or not, if you look in the refuge tree, if they're there, you can take refuge. That would be an easy guideline. Very good. That is a good question. Quite technical, but good question. Alright? 